I'll let you know right away, we are not going to be talking about extolling the virtues of GMOs over organic. This is not that kind of talk. I am not that kind of person. Okay, you're welcome to go, that's fine. So the title is a net result of me being a snarky nerd who sometimes thinks she's clever and or funny. So what we're going to talk about here, well, first we're gonna introduce me. So I am Heather Osborne. I am a 25 plus year systems engineer, DevOps manager, architect kind of person. I spent about 25, uh, 24 years at Ticketmaster where most of my career was. I worked on legacy and on-prem systems. And then a couple of years ago here, I did a talk to that effect, um, modernization as a forcing function, uh, talking about how to encourage people to move on from these legacy paradigms and move toward the more modern solutions. This talk is not on purpose an extension of that talk, but it is just by the nature of my career uh, development over the years. More recently, I've been at a couple of startups, and I'm making a little bit of background noise, a couple of startups on public cloud. Everything I've done in, since 2020 has been entirely public cloud. And I've served as both a senior director of DevOps as well as a system architect. So a little bit more about me, and I gave you some of these systems ideas here. A little bit more about me. I'm a bona fide crazy cat lady. I've got four of the beasties. I had to air gap my clothing and my laptop bag so that I could come here and look moderately presentable, not covered in cat hair. They are particularly adept at walking across my desk when I'm in the middle of a production console uh, work that I'm doing. And I'm also a distance runner. So I get a lot of time to think about these things while I'm out running. And I will say I'm an immersive camping enthusiast. And if you wanna know what that means, you can ask me later, but I basically consider it I go out and be a jackass in the desert at really weird events. So what's the story I'm telling here? Because organic isn't good for you in every case. The analogy fits particularly in the case of infrastructure. Just because it's not artificial, just because it's not, um, uh, just because it's fake doesn't mean it's not good for you. I wanna remind you that because it's organic, it doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you. And as I said, this particularly applies to infrastructure. You have the rapid organic growth, you have all of these things that you can no longer decipher. You can't figure out where the vine goes on the fence. None of these things. So how many of you work in a well-architected environment? Raise a hand or two. Oh, I see the architect over here raising his hand. Were your systems painstakingly designed and laid out with a thought towards all the illities, the security, the stability, the maintainability, the sustainability, the general promoting the go to bed on time ability. Uh, not, nope, nope, okay. <laughs> oh, Alan over here is going, well, yeah, I wasn't expecting to see a lot of hands here. So this is where we're going with this. So what is the story we're trying to tell? And I can't read my screen. This is great. Okay, I got it, Never mind. So the first segment we're gonna go to is how you end up creating an organic mess. Next one is we're gonna tell the story of the background spaghetti. And then we're gonna figure out, do you really know what's wrong with your systems? Probably not. And then you realize, whoa, this is actually a bigger problem than we were expecting. And you might as well just yeet the whole thing. You're done with this. There's no business in keeping this around. It's more effort than it's worth. And then finally, we'll talk about what we did, solved it with tools for fun and profit. So I said I spent my 24 years or so at Ticketmaster dealing with legacy systems on mostly on-prem infrastructure. I'm gonna give you the story of my more recent journeys at startups. 
my unfortunately recently ex company. It's not a good time for tech startups, so be it. But the name of the company is irrelevant. The story still needs to be told because I feel this is something that I've hit every time I've worked anywhere. Every systems I've encountered have been this organic mess of a beast that grows over time. I will say that one benefit of this being at a startup is that it's not as deeply entrenched into the infrastructure and there's, it's less far to back out of it to, to get yourself on a good path. So the model of a startup, you have, my microphone is bugging me, I can hear, pull it out a little bit more. I can hear myself moving around. <laughs> So the model of a startup, you hire some people with some brilliant ideas, super smart people. They have this idea that's gonna make you a million dollars, let's go run with this. A million dollars a little undercutting it, but it is what it is. So these people are not necessarily infrastructure people. They don't know what they're setting up. They have no idea what a VPC is. They have no idea what an internet gateway is. They don't know what database to use. But in this day and age of cloud services, you see these ads come up. Set up an application in a day. They see this on the AWS site and they go, ooh, I can do that. And you get a whole team of people working together. They're really smart developers, but they still have no idea how you should back things with a database, how you should set up security groups, none of these things. But well, we use Elastic Beanstalk as an example. That's this quickly launched web applications is one about Elastic Beanstalk. Bam, the site's up. You've got this great site. It was a great idea. You're making all sorts of money on it. You've got people asking for features because this is something that you want to expand and run with. Well, what happens here? Well, it's booming. Let's hire some more engineers. Let's get these features built in. This expands into organic growth. You start adding things to the things that you already created that you didn't necessarily know how they worked in the first place. You just bolted some things onto the side of it. And then you go, hey, we should probably hire a DevOps engineer. And I will say, DevOps engineer is a misnomer. It's not an occupation. It's a philosophy. But for the sake of argument and for the sake of ease, I'm using the term DevOps engineer and or SRE interchangeably. So you get your first DevOps engineer. They come in and they go, wait, what? What is this business that I'm looking at? What is this nonsense? What is this organic beast that you've just now unleashed me on? And we have to be compliant. How do we get our security laid out in such a way that makes sense? Because I don't even know how this application works. How do you do your releases? What is it that you do? How do you promote it through your environments? Where are, where's the code in the release process in the software development cycle? You got your software in my in infrastructure as code. I got my infrastructure code in your software. Things are tightly coupled. You can't unravel it without going very much in depth. So how do we start untangling this and how do we start thinking about it? So, as I mentioned, this is the tale of my DevOps journey at startups. We've got all very knowledgeable and talented people, industry best practices. This is me referring to my DevOps team in particular. They understand the industry best practices. They know how to work with our stack. We'll say AWS, Kubernetes, GitHub, using a Terraform for infrastructure's code, and backed by Postgres database. For the most part, it's primarily Ruby on Rails, and we use Istio as a service mesh. So this sounds ab absolutely straightforward. You go, okay, that's, yeah, standard uh, web application built on public cloud. Well, if you go back to the concept I was saying about a startup and the folks who built it not having necessarily an idea of what they were doing when they built it, you end up with things being put together by trial and error. You got the organic growth and you've bolted some things on the side of it, 
you've copy pasted code because it worked before doing this thing, so let's just change a couple of values in here and make it do something entirely different that was not related to what it was designed for in the first place, you end up with an epic spider web, a big pot of spaghetti, a ball of yarn. So before the current team got involved, there was a great concept of how to enable developers to move quickly. We used ephemeral environments that we refer to as ODEs, or on-demand environments. This worked great for our monolith. Things don't always stay a monolith. You, again, bolt things onto the side. You got that organic growth. The spaghetti is leaking out of the pot. And this is driving me nuts. <laughs> A little below my chin? Okay, let's see. No, I appreciate it. It's like, I don't need to hear myself breathing. <laughs> Whoa, maybe not. <laughs> okay. So this on-demand environment is a great idea for the monolith, as I mentioned. It spins up a temporary Kubernetes pod and basically put your code there, runs all the tests, spins it down, and then it's ready to roll to production. So that's great, but what happens when you branch that application? What happens when you throw some microservices in the mix? You add an authorization service. You extract the front end from the, the monolith. Now you have these short-lived environments that they spin up, they do a thing, they test the monolith, but they are not QAing your code at all. All you have is just this very small piece of the picture that is being tested. Also fine, you need a more robust test environment. But you're not allowed to touch dev because, as I mentioned, things grew organically. The dev environment was originally supposed to be a proof of concept cluster and not actually an environment. You have, in prod, you have Beanstalk. In dev, you have Kubernetes running. That means prod and dev are nothing alike. The code's the same, but the mechanisms behind it are entirely different. Well, people need to test their stuff. So what do you do? You build a release environment. The release environment being a little more like prod, kind of like dev. It's got the microservice, it's got the auth service. It's part of the dev cluster. It does things that moderately resemble prod, but are not actually what you want to be doing. Another problem, only one person can use this magical test test? Okay, thank you, it was very loud and uh, disconcerting. <laughs> only one person can use this magical test environment at a time, and you have no visibility into what it is that this test environment is running, what version of code is running, whether it's currently being used for UAT, whether it's currently being used for microservice testing, et cetera. So we can't mess with dev because that would impair developer velocity. We don't have the resources or the time to build out this uh, on-demand environment to be a little more robust and include the microservices and the other services. So what do you do? You know what? You might as well test in prod. That's the closest thing to prod as you're going to get. So the team sat down one day to make a simple change. We had an alert saying we weren't getting all of our audit logs. That's a critical alert because we were required to have audit logs. So one of my engineers sat down, started debugging it. I went, OK, it's a problem with Fluent D. We're just gonna upgrade that, take a second. Nope, we don't know why that's where it is. Okay, well we don't know why if I put this block in here, it doesn't do anything, we don't know this. So we pull in our lead dev, we pull in another dev, we pull in another dev. Pretty soon there are five of us, including myself, sitting there debugging a very inconsequential problem because, you can adjust it again. Thank you. Which means when I exhale, it's gonna make some really interesting sounds. Can you still, okay, I'm still in the mic. 
We'll see how this goes. <laughs> so this simple change that we're making, theoretically just upgrading Fluent-D, figuring out why it's throwing an error, we ended up with five well-paid engineers sitting on a call for the better half of the afternoon. This is a huge waste of resources. And this was by no means an isolated incident. You have all of these problems that because your code makes no sense, because your infrastructure's code makes no sense, because it wasn't developed by someone who gave it half a thought before they put it in place, you end up playing this game of unravel a little bit of the sweater. Oops, that's not it. Let's tie it back up. Let's unravel the other sleeve. Let's go figure things out. You spend days and days on end debugging simple issues. And don't even get me started. I am the one who was responsible for cost optimization. Like, oh, look, there's a Microsoft SQL database sitting out there. What is that? Nothing's tagged. Another uh, addition to that pile of problems where we can't figure out where the source of the problem is. So nothing's tagged. We have a Microsoft SQL database out there. Nothing in our shop runs Microsoft. Why is this thing here? It's costing us three grand a month. Well, let's destroy it. Well, was it built by code? Was it built by ClickOps? How do you get rid of it? If I destroy it ClickOps and it's in code, is it going to come back? What do you do? All of these problems just resulted in us going, wait, what is this nonsense? It is just worse and worse and worse. So we need to figure out what's wrong. What in the name of organic nonsense is this infrastructure that we're working with. We can't provide the software engineers with what they need. That's a testable environment. We can't unleash them on their own to operate in the true sense of the term DevOps because the Terraform was so convoluted that DevOps would spend half a day figuring out what was going on. They couldn't reasonably dissect it. I fondly referred to this as Terraform. And we also couldn't be happy DevOps and security engineers because there's zero consistency, there's zero documentation, there's no failover, there's no disaster recovery, and there's no best practices. When we read a white paper and we go, ooh, that's great, let's incorporate that, there's no path to that when you have this over, overly complex environment. So what do we do? We need to determine where it hurts. One thing I've learned over the years, developers will say, it sucks. You know what? It sucks is not an answer for what's wrong. It is a blanket term that's used for every technology issue. Well, what's wrong with it? Uh, it just doesn't work for me. Also, not helpful. Doesn't tell you a thing, doesn't tell you where the problem might lie, doesn't tell you what we can do incrementally to help get you out of this blockage that you're in. So to start trying to unravel this issue, and move to a model where people can speak about things intelligently as a factor of tech maturity more eloquently than it sucks, you need to actually talk to the people. You can't throw out a survey monkey and say, OK, what's wrong with X, Y, and Z? They'll just answer what's wrong with X, Y, and Z, and it won't be data that you can actually use and make into something or make into pain points. So what we had to do. I conducted an interview with every team lead and a member of their team to figure out what was going on. My intent when I kicked this off was to find out what are the low-hanging fruit. Organically, of course. What can we do to unblock the developers? So I'm going to show you a big nasty diagram here. And I don't know whether you can read any of these. But this was the net outcome of my interviews. And apologies for the typos. I, because I no longer work for the company, I transcribed this from a screenshot. So it's my horrible typing. But I broke things up into groups about whether things were taking too long, whether it was a consistency problem, whether it was a documentation or a policy issue. Whether it was a test environment issue, simple complexity issue, well, that's irony or um, oxymoron there. Uh, whether it was a release process or a testing process issue. And broke down things by the teams 
broke down things by the security team, what things impacted everybody, what things specifically impacted the data team, and found some patterns around these things, found what it was that was really the root of people's pain points. And you'll see here there are a lot of things. Can you actually read this from somewhere? Okay, that's great. You are a one-up on me. <laughs> so I'm going to move over here to the side so I can see this one. So we got some of the release process, uh, testing process ones. No decommissioning or offboarding consideration. This goes back to my original talk about uh, getting things to move to end of life. Uh, we have out-of-date documentation. If you look at the data column, we have an entire, entirely separate data ecosystem than we do app ecosystem, which means that they are doing things very differently from how the application teams are doing things. We have things like the on-demand environments are called out there that we don't have the microservices attached to them. We have some things like the uh, product and uh, the product and design teams are trying to do UAT against the release environment, and there's only one of those release environments, so that's not sustainable. The complexity we have, the uh, we couldn't set up a new firewall. We couldn't test out new software, such as adding Confluent to the mix because of the way the network was set up. So it was a, okay, we have to go rip off the Band-Aid. We can't test these things in advance because we don't have a infrastructure or security specific environment to test in. And let's see what other ones. Um, no standard. No load testing. All of these things are very common. I said, none of this is very specific to the company I was working for. This has really been a plague of all of the companies that I've worked for. But this was in particularly interesting to me because I had the luxury of being able to actually collect some data and get some patterns around what it was that was causing the legitimate issues. So, if I was following, yes, uh, what the, color the colors, the legend is down the side. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like I said, never mind my dis misspelling. I know consistency is spelled wrong. Among many other things, I started to try to load a new copy of this with the spelling corrections, and I couldn't do it from just my laptop because my screen was not big enough to take a screenshot. I just went, never mind, you get to deal with my typos. Don't have budget? No, budget. We, bu budget comes in in the next, uh, the next part of the, the discussion there. So because this was so huge, if we were doing an agile process, we would have done an inception. We would have figured out what we were doing. We would have figured out the plan. But there was way too much going on here. So we had to take a two-pronged approach. And I'll say we also had the luxury of having a developer productivity team. They were more developer facing. They were a lot more in tune with the very small bits that they could correct to help the developers in their day-to-day -day life. So they were identifying the really, really low hanging fruit. Like there's one up here that's a uh, move this to a script. And then there's one that's uh, we don't know in Slack when something's been released. So those were the sort of things that the developer productivity team was able to take care of. They decided to be on the side working on a number of these things, and this was great because it gave the engineers uh, the idea that we were working on things really hard for them. We were trying to unblock them. We were trying to make it suck less for them. You name it. So a couple of the things that that team did, and that. These are their story. These are not the area the DevOps team was going, but just so you get a little background. We added some observability to the release environment so we knew what versions were running there. We added uh, GitHub merge queue so you no longer had to sit there and wait until a Slack channel updated with this person is done. Now, now Bob can take over because George is done. We set up a golden DB because we always had stale data in these on-demand environments and releases data, as you can see here, releases data was nothing like prods data, was nothing like 
on-demand uh, on data. So you want to have a set of data that is consistent across the board. We improved the pipelines so that the testing, more of the testing could be done locally instead of chewing up our GitHub action minutes. There's some cost for you. Uh, incorporated API contact, contract testing, which hadn't existed previously, or it had and nobody had bothered. Uh, the DevProd team, the developer productivity team, was a fantastic partner in this whole endeavor. But as I mentioned, these ones I just listed here were their story, not the DevOps side of the story. They were happening in parallel to knock out some of these more immediate pain points. So what was the DevOps side of things going to do? Well, we had a huge infrastructure problem. Obviously, I see my Mark over there rolling his eyes. We've got a couple of choices. Well, choice one, Greenfield. Yes, that's a bad word in a lot of cases. You know why? You have this really wonderful system that you've worked on really hard and it's perfect and everything's great and then you release it to the wild and 60% of the people move over and the other 40% of the people are like, I'm not gonna bother. And then you end up supporting both the brand new shiny system and the old system that you wanted to get rid of in the first place. So we were understandably hesitant to go down this route. Choice two. You mentioned prod is different than dev. Dev is on Kubernetes. Prod is on Elastic Beanstalk. Technically, dev is the newer version, but prod is the more consistent version. What do you do? Well, in theory, you clean up prod, as in let's get it upgraded to Kubernetes. Let's clean up some of the logic issues around prod. I don't know that you saw on the past slide it was uh, dev had overlapping subnets, that was why we couldn't just upgrade dev and move forward with that. The, the concept being you clean up prod, you make a copy of it to dev, you use that as the new dev, you use the new dev for doing your more complicated release that you need to do, and then you go back and forth until you iterate through it is what it is that you need to do. So the estimated time on that was at least 12 months because you needed to be slow and cautious in getting these things cleaned up. You're still messing with production. You're still doing things untested. You're still doing things that, is, that are the whole reason you wanted to have a solid dev environment in the first place. And I didn't mention at the beginning of this, this was an urgent issue. This was something we needed to resolve now. We didn't have the luxury of 12 months to work on it. And then choice three, this is the one that makes me cry, improve in place. This is a continuation of the effort where we just kept spending all afternoon working on a very simple item that should have taken us 15 minutes. Another problem with this is we didn't necessarily have the time, nor did we have the personnel to lock in a room for half days figuring out each step. It doesn't necessarily have a quantifiable time to market. We couldn't even throw that 12 months to get it to market. And it also doesn't have a definition of done. We don't know when we've finished what it is that we were trying to do. So we took this and we presented it to the people with the money, back to the budget thing, and we laid out a very careful matrix of what the risk assessments were, what the time, of market, time to market was, what the associated costs were. For example, the clean, uh, clean up prod copy to dev, that was gonna result in a duplicate environment for a significant period of time. Greenfield was gonna have an extra environment, but you could move a lot faster in that extra environment. You name it, we did all of that analysis, and I don't have that sheet to share with you, but let's just say we went through all of these things. We ranked things by scores. We tried to figure out what it would do, what we could do most quickly, what incremental improvements we could offer, what low-hanging fruits we could give to the developers to show that, yes, this is something that's helping them. So our path to buy-in, here's we, we've chosen the Greenfield environment at this time because both of the other two options we had out there were really not a viable option. 
like it, it pained me to say that the, the greenfield was the best solution because I've been through it before, but there really wasn't a better option. So we presented that matrix and everybody went, yeah, you know what? I, I think you're right. I think we're going with the greenfield version. Nobody wanted to continue with the convoluted, untestable, maybe secure infrastructure that we had. And we wanted to have a path to getting people to upgrade by making it so appealing, making it so fun, making the toolbox so easy to work with that they wanted to move there. It wasn't a, let's go play in your Terraform for six hours to get you unblocked. This was a, oh, here's the thing and this is the way things should work together. So we got the go ahead. I segmented my team a little bit as a, management person, I don't like getting one section of the team something new and shiny to play with and making the other guys play with the old stuff. We, it's just bad practice, it lends itself to a lot of unhappiness. But what we were trying to do, we were trying to cut down the existing support of our current infrastructure so that we didn't have to it was a, a keep doing, start doing, stop doing type of thing where we could say, this is not helping us. This is not something we want to sustain into the next year, so let's just stop doing this thing. And we could then put more resources towards building the new instead of just focusing on fixing the old. Obviously, break fix and things like that were going to be uh, still an uh, issue, but the bulk of the effort was put towards building the new environment. So what do we want out of a new environment? Well, we never want to do anything that's not in code. We had just a mix of done in code, not done in code, and we had no rhyme or reason to why things were the way they were. We wanted to always include code validation, or include everything validation. We want to make sure that things are ready to go. We know from the ground, ground up that things are ready to go. We want to keep documentation close to code. Uh, how many of you know what a graveyard confluence is and where all of your documentation goes to die? And unless you have a full-time dedicated tech writer, which I don't think most of us have the luxury of, you really can't find anything useful. You do a bunch of searching and hope that you find a keyword that might match. You put your, you put your documentation in the same repos as your software. That's how you find your documentation. We simplify the product engineering job. They don't need to know the ins and outs of Terraform. They don't need to know the ins and outs of Helm charts. They just need to know what they're asking for. They need to know what it is that they're trying to build. They need to know why they're trying to build this. And mind you, we're providing a paved path. They don't have to go down the paved path. They can do off the path and support it themselves. But that's a choice. That's not the way that we're making them go. They can diverge if they support it on their own, if they have the know-how to diverge from that paved path. If they don't, they can go down the normal path and everything works the way they're supposed to. Testability. That was most of that grid that I showed you was we had no way to test things in prod environments, et cetera. Consistent environments, that's another one. Dev and prod, nothing alike. Security, what environment? We don't have one of those. We wanted a low touch release process with visibility. We wanted to know what version of code we were on and where it was at any given point in time. We wanted to have some pretty sturdy guardrails so that we didn't have Terraform spaghetti again we wanted to make things more straightforward, be able to see the bigger picture without having to spend the hours dissecting the solution. No spaghetti. Spaghetti is bad, especially organic spaghetti, especially those gluten intolerant among us. So, it's so clean. What are we doing here? We're doing some declarative GitOps here. We want to promote the desired state to the intended environment. So we creating a platform cluster. Oh my goodness, DevOps has a playground. DevOps has a place where they can do things. We have an environment that we can now test changes without impacting production. 
previously we were mm, entirely test, to pro test on prod. Uh, the, the folks working on our um, product delivery, all our JIRA and stuff like that, was, why are you skipping over the section about testing? Like, mm, once we merge code, it's, it's, uh, it's in there. Um, sorry. As well, security was going to be thrilled to have a test bed as well. I want to test this, this new firewall. I want to test this, uh, this WAF. I want to do these things. They wanted an environment to do this. So we're going to create an app alpha, a, a platform alpha. We're going to create a platform beta. We're going to create a platform stable. Code will never be deployed directly to platform stable because things should be promoted through the lower environments for all of the validations that I mentioned before that we were aspiring for. Obviously, there will be a break glass because reality, but that's not the way things are supposed to go. And then when we start going to app, everything will have had to pass through the alpha, the beta, and the stage again, or in the, at the stable again. It's the equivalent of dev, staging, and prod. So I'm showing you some, some diagram here. What is the problem we ran into? We want to use the same tools to de deploy the base infrastructure as will be used to deploy the applications. Who would have thought that we would actually want to use some consistency at our tooling across the environments? So this actually caused us a little bit of slowdown. We realized that our old templating process, the cookie cutter, was wasn't going to meet our needs because it was as spaghetti as everything else was. It didn't follow the, the normal paradigms of something like a cookie cutter application. So it was unnecessarily complex. And as well, my team sat there for days going, wait, what is this thing doing? Why is it doing that thing? So the decision was made to do this before we moved forward. So we moved all of this cookie cutter concept to a GitHub application that uses GitHub topics to subscribe to template repos and get updates. So this saved us from our current complication, which was we make a change to the cookie cutter, we push out all of these PRs that everybody needs to merge, everybody looks in GitHub and goes, oh, there's a PR there that needs to be merged. It's not mine, I'm gonna leave it there. And then we end up three months later where nobody has updated their templates. So this was a fairly quick win. As I mentioned, we wanted to give the developers a quick win so they could see the benefits of what it was that we in DevOps were trying to do. It took a lot of the heavy lifting off of the engineers' hands. They no longer had to go merge all of those PRs that meant absolutely nothing to them. They now had a version control. They could see what it was that was being changed with every iteration that went out. You name it. So once we got this aspect of deployment straightened out, we were able to run with starting to set up our EKS clusters. So we, I'll say we worked with a mix of the uh, Amazon uh, EKS blueprint as well as some of the grunt work reference architecture for coming up with the, the general best practices for setting up EKS clusters. And I'll call out here, this diagram was drawn in Excaladraw. If you don't know Excaladraw, it is fantastic for making uh, simple diagrams. It's open source. We found it, some salesperson was doing a demo for us and they were using it while we were on there and it was super easy and we went, ooh, that's neat, I need that. I see everybody looking it up on their phone. <laughs> I don't work for Excaladraw. <laughs> Okay, so I mentioned that one of the things we need to do is validate everything. We want to validate in local, so we're going to use things like pre-commit hooks. We want to detect the problems before they move to version control. We want to keep it out of the more expensive side of things. Don't put it in GitHub if it doesn't need to be in GitHub yet. Uh, we want to validate in CI. So we've got conf test and things like that, um, testing against the structured configuration data so we know exactly where we're going with that. We want deployment validation. So we've got gatekeeper uh, OPA, OPA there. We've got an admission controller for Kubernetes to enforce the policies in real time. Uh, during the resource creation, we explored a little bit uh, with Kyverno, but we opted to go the gatekeeper route. 
And then the validation in cluster, uh, in cluster runtime, we use uh, AWS guard duty for that just to uh, figure out the threat detection and things like that in advance of having this is independent of our application necessarily, but we want to get everything completely validated before we even spin up the infrastructure and then continue on into the application. So tools, what tools did we use for building this all out? So we've got cargo slash Argo. So uh, the continuous delivery and a lifestyle orchestration. So as I mentioned, we never deploy too stable. We promote things through the environments and use the concept, uh, the terminology called out by Cargo. They refer to things as freight that you ship through the process. We do all the validation at the lower environments, including the, the uh, container images, the uh, Kubernetes manifest, the chart, the Helm charts, the repositories, et cetera. We use Harbor to store the artifacts and have them pre-scanned. We use GitHub Actions and GitHub Applications. Uh, Istio Service Mesh, we did have Istio before, but in the idea of folks that don't know what they're doing setting something up, and Istio being a fairly complicated thing, if you don't completely rein it in, we ended up with this a very big mess of Istio that wasn't doing at all what it intended to do. And the thought of upgrading that thing struck terror in our hearts. But setting up Istio from the ground up so that you knew exactly what it was doing and it was specifically set up for your environment was not a bad call. And then Terraform, hopefully this time with less terror. Had I still been employed, I would have been showing you a demo at right about this point. But I thought that the story of how we got to thinking about building up uh, environments that are using things in ways that they should be used was still a valid story to tell. So with that, any questions? Which cat is that? that is Bishop. Yes. <laughs> oh, right. Not for nothing. Back at the beginning, did it ever just occur to you just shut down your Microsoft SQL database and see who screamed? So, 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 Mark, you probably dealt with me doing that at Ticketmaster a couple of times. <laughs> we, we did. That's ultimately what we did, but it didn't answer the question of whether it was in code or not. On how did the team respond to change happening and what did you have to do to be able to get people to buy in or were people pretty bought into wanting to go to the golden path in a new shiny way? I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, I, well, I can just speak loudly. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. So um, what did you have to do to get the team to buy in? How was it received? Did you have to do kind of an internal evangelizing effort? Or did everybody kind of realize that you had to change and that this was a good thing to happen? So, so this was what I was saying about needing to show the incremental improvement. We didn't want to go uh, develop a new infrastructure in a vacuum. We needed to show little bits and pieces that would be appealing to people as we went along. We had to keep the regular demos going of this is a thing, this is the way it works now, this is what we're going to move towards. The developer productivity team I mentioned was very in tune with it. They were very gung-ho about it because, like I said, they were doing the let's pick the little bits off the corner of the glass and uh, make it a little more transparent they were evangelizing it more than us. We were working on getting it set up in such a way that we would be able to move to it sooner than later. But when I mentioned the, like the replacement for cookie cutter and being able to get those things, people went, oh, that's great. I don't have to merge all these crappy PRs that I don't know what they are and why they're there and why are they even here. I'm not going to touch them and get the most recent version of things more easily than they have been in the past. 
Uh, yeah, a similar question. Um, do you, uh, I have written several product plans as a developer, um, right? Because I want to be able to convince my bosses or, you know, just lay out all the options, right? Um, but you talked about, um, you know, cost and risks. And do you have any recommendations for general best practices? Um, because most of what I do is I lay out a feature matrix, but I don't really consider um, maybe the business impact and that sort of thing. And I do think that's the next level for me. Yeah, that that was a very useful exercise for us to be able to sit there and like we basically did a ranking of one to five of how risky is this? How much is this going to cost? What what is the duration of having something, you know, a, an environment that's not getting any traffic, having that stood up for X amount of time versus having a exact copy of the huge environment that we have that probably has a bunch of garbage like that Microsoft database that doesn't even need to be there having a full clone of that and things like that. So it was a super useful exercise to be able to think about it from the business perspective. That was where I got pulled into it was trying to convince the people with the money why it was that we were doing these things. The tech people are usually relatively easy to sell. If you say I'm giving you something cool to work with, they're going to go like, sure. It's the business people who are signing the checks that are going to be the ones who are a little more hesitant. And if you can convince them by way of data, then usually you have an easier time of it. Um, how long did this take you? This, uh, the part we got up to, so from, it's time to start thinking about what's wrong with things, so all of the assessment and the interviews and all of that, I'll say that started a little under a year ago. And then all of the assessment, we had kind of buy off by summer. And by summer, we set up a POC of like, yes, you want everything to be done in code, but sometimes you need to take a break and do things, some click ops for a little while just to get your ideas down before you start uh, committing it to code. So we did a POC that was due in September. From there, we were gonna do an MVP, minimum viable platform. And that was going to be where we could start rolling through the process of setting up the infrastructure using what it was that we were going to use to ultimately deploy code. So that was, I'll say that was due like a month ago. So it's, it's a better part of a year still, but it was, we realized a significantly heavier project than we thought it was going to be when we kicked it off. It was like, oh, we'll just fix, fix it for the devs. It's no problem. We'll just do that. And it got that original project when I first started got tossed between team after team after team. Like, oh, I can solve this. Oh, no, I can't. Oh, I can solve this. No, I can't. You just needed to rip off the Band-Aid and go build it fresh. And uh, I know you said you're no longer with the company, so I don't know if you can answer this, but I'm curious about adoption. Um, was it successful? It like, I'm still in touch with the team, obviously. Uh, the team is still working on it. They are, the infrastructure is stood up now. Um, they are working on getting the initial applications ported over. And one of the things about getting the, uh, um, the cookie cutter type situation set up was that you could use the same one on the legacy code as you could use on the new code. And that was something that was going to make the step a lot easier to take to moving to the new environment. But what we wanted to do was move the monolith over. That wasn't necessarily going to be the easy one at all because that was going to need to get migrated to Kubernetes and so on. But it was a let's pick off some of these microservices and get them moved over, at least get them using the new cookie cutter, get the or templater is the better word for it, but let's get them moved over to using that. And then when it comes time, we can just stand them up on the new infrastructure.
so this was not customer facing. There was not an impact to the end users that were seeing it, but it was the folks on the inside that said, hey, we need to upgrade to this ber version of Postgres because it's gonna go end of life on AWS if we don't do this now. Well, how are we gonna do that without causing customer impact? And that's where we started to have to think about things like how do we do these upgrades? How do we test these things without just... We had to do a database upgrade where the easiest route was let's just cut over to the new one, see if it works, okay, cut back. And that was not an ideal state to be in. And we, you know, the, the nature of the business, we didn't want to impact customers at all. It's, you know, it's healthcare industry and we really don't want to leave somebody hanging on that front. And it really was grown from the developers going, this really sucks. And we had to figure out why it sucked for them. Like, yes, uh, DevOps knew exactly why it sucked, but you know, to, to try to serve our customers, the developers were our customers. What was it that we needed to do to make it better for them? And ultimately, uh, time to market for products and so on was serving the customers outside of the company as well as the, comp the customers, our DevOps customers of the product engineers. was a originally something that was like a startup that had built into something with a whole bunch of spaghetti and I imagine that you got a whole bunch of metrics for it and then when you grew into this you had an idea of what it was you needed and ended up deciding what you were going to create afterward from that but if you were to instead just create an entirely new organization what different things would you be doing as a result of what you had learned from this so I think the question was, uh, I had the benefit of a little more flexibility because I was in a startup organization, but if I ended up in a different, bigger organization with a little less flexibility, how I would? Not quite. If you were to do this all over again kind of thing, right? Like, I don't know if you were here when the business had originally started, um, but the, uh, I imagine because you are in this and you had time to figure out what it was you needed, right? Like you would have gotten metrics, for example, for what it is you needed uh, in your green field. But if you didn't have that, for example, and you were just setting up, here's a new business, would you have some new lessons you would have learned from it as a result? Okay, I, I see what your question is. Is uh, If I had the information I have now and I was setting something up from scratch, would I? be a little more successful at it. Yes. And I, I, I would say, yes, hell yes. The more you know, the, the better you are. And I am thankful that I had this experience because I now know what sort of things can go absolutely wrong. And obviously that's gonna change because what you knew yesterday is different tomorrow. And being able to at least form the, the concepts around dissecting what it is that needs to happen is something that will carry on into the next the next round you know you got to keep up with the current technology that's why coming to something like this is great because you get to hear what the next generation of things is and be able to work from there if you know what it is that is the problem in your environment you can start something new using the, the new and shiny that's outdated a week later but you know <laughs> Would you have any particular things that you would, that come to mind for, if you're making something new, these are the now the things I have in mind? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. So if you were to do that, do you have, these are the new things that I would have in mind to do, right? Or would you just uh, say, now that I have the experience, we can do it better? Is this an experience thing, or are there other takeaway lessons you could make from it? Uh, at least at this, uh you were asking, you know, with the, the knowledge of the new stuff coming out versus the experience I had, which way I would go kind of thing. I would say at this point, I like what we came up with and I would run with that for a little while because I'm still a fan of Argo. I've actually used it my previous, uh, previous job as well. It uh, gives some visibility and a little more flexibility and uh, you can see what's happening in your environment without having to... Uh, to manually break it apart, and I do enjoy that. And uh, I was a bigger fan of GitLab. I know GitHub is a sponsor here, but I'm, I'm now a fan of GitHub as well. So 
uh, I appreciate those uh, those areas that we can roll through. I do like the idea that was actually a good idea that we were trying to keep along was the ephemeral environments, being able to spin up an environment and test uh, offsides and not have to manually do that every time. There's a lot of concepts, you know, over years of experience, you pick up things that you go, oh, that'd be great, I'm gonna reuse that idea. And then you, next time you go, ooh, no, never touching that thing again. So it's, it's really just experience, trial and error, knowing what's going on for a particular company. And they're all gonna be different. And I'm not sure the microphone is working. <laughs> How did I convince the business people to go along with it? Yes. TLDR. Okay. I, I caught that you, uh, that you could convince the developers to go along with it, but how do you convince the business people to go along with it? I'll say that uh, unhappy developers are very loud developers. So you'll end up with them telling the business people that it's the infrastructure causing them problems, and that's why their features are not making it to market, or that's why DevOps is a roadblock, and things like that. So if we could get the data out there, get the assessment of the environments, get the assessment of what it was gonna take out there, then it was a lot easier to convince the business folks because we were impacting their developers, impacting their new features to market, impacting these things. And effectively, you're just taking away excuses. So once they got the concept that yes, this was a problem and this was impacting the business, then it was, it was easy to go. As long as you can say what the money looks like and who it's gonna help, then I think that's a, a fairly easy, uh, I won't say that's always the case. I've been in companies where you gotta convince somebody that I need one extra server, please, just that extra server because we have that much more traffic. In a reasonable company, you should be able to, <laughs> to, to convince them with, with, with data and with squeaky wheels. <laughs> Might need to be the next, last question. Hello? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, what, what was the time frame in terms of weeks or months for, if you could break it down into three parts, so, so the planning where you were doing the figuring out what to do and you came up with the three plans, the three options, how long was that? And then the second thing from that point when you presented it until the people with the money said go ahead and do the greenfield, how long was that, the convincing? And then the third one, how long was it from that point to actually get it running and in the prod and everything's up and running and the apps are in the thing and in the new greenfield prod. So like, you know, what was it one month for the first one, the second one was two months and the third one was 12 months, something like that. Uh, okay, so I did answer a little bit of that uh, previously. The assessment, the matrix of what the cost benefit analysis and why, which of the three plans we should choose and all of that. I mentioned this was urgent, so this was that was a pretty tight timeline. We needed to get all of this data together. I spent some late nights coming up with, with numbers, figuring out how much things cost so I could present it to the people that were gonna pay the bills. The second question being, how long did it take that decision to get made after that data was presented? That was, I'll say a week. Uh, we had to make sure the correct people were around. We had to make sure they understood what it was we were trying to sell them. And that went pretty quickly. And then in terms of building out the infrastructure, that one was still a work in progress. I mentioned the POC that was ClickOps, mentioned the minimum viable platform, which was a work in progress and soon to be adopting uh, production workloads. So it's still not It's, it's still not yet. done. No, I sadly had to leave before it got to see its day in the I sun. Mean, can you just say like, you know, weeks or months? Was that a month, six months, 12 months? Before it was going to be up? Or? What is your estimate from when they gave you the money 
until it will actually be working 100% with prod for everything? With prod for everything, I'm going to say that's probably a year and a half. Year and a half. Yeah, because every application, different. Not even, not even slightly similar. A not long using. Time. Yep, a long a time. Long time. Okay. You still have some spaghetti in to unravel, but at least you're unraveling it okay, to you. a clean pot. <laughs> and will the slides be available? Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So like the first one was a couple of weeks, maybe the second one was a couple of weeks, and the third one, the 18 months. Yeah, and you figure we only had one and a half to two people working on it because we still had to support the existing environment. So that, that always being the challenge. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.